thing turned. There we go. Hello. Good morning. We'll try that again. Welcome. We're glad that you're here. I see some familiar faces, and um, I see some not familiar faces, and that's fantastic. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Worthington Church, and we have lots and lots of announcements today. Um, first off, I'm going to ask Mrs. O to come up. She has an announcement for us. Good morning, church family. It is that time of year when teachers are heading back to school and students. Um, at Worthington Adventist Academy, the teachers report back on Monday, and then the students' first day is the 14th. Um, we are excited about it. Um, enrollment looks like it's going to be in the mid-90s, and so we praise God for that. Um, last night I got a call from Miss B, our upper grade teacher. She has had an eventful summer in that she's had two knee replacements, one just a week and a half ago, and she wanted to be here to make this announcement, but she is resting. So I'm going to make it for her. Um, she has a former student um, that, has, that would be in her class this year that right now is not financially able to be at the school this year. And she, we are looking for somebody to sponsor her for the year. So if anybody is interested in partaking of that and helping us out, you can contact Miss B. You can call the school and speak with Mrs. Green, talk with me, and I can get you the information that you are needed, needing. So make it a matter of prayer, and if you would like to help out with it, let us know. Thank you, Mrs. O. So I got these new glasses yesterday. Let's, let's see how they work. Uh, we have a membership transfer, second reading. I'm going to do my best to pronounce all these names correct. Um, Shannon Himes uh, from New Hope SDA. Valerie Green from Ephesus. Uh, Gregor Stanzwinski and Colleen. Uh, looks like the whole family, Kaylee, Lena, um, all of those folks uh, to Berrien Springs Pioneer Memorial. Uh, Pastor Jeremy Wong from Centerville. Chaplain Brooke Wong from Centerville. Nelson Mendez uh, from Puerto Rico. Madeline Rodriguez from Puerto Rico. And Helena Mendez from Puerto Rico. How'd I do, Miriam? pretty good okay so this is a second reading for all these transfers um, do I have a motion to approve these so move second second all right fantastic thank you that's great that's that's great um, next we have Sandy who has a announcement Sandy if you want to come on up Okay, I was going to use this one because I'm shaking. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to read it. Good morning. How are you? It's good to see you. Um, I have one sad thing to first sh share with you. I don't know if everybody knows Dave Bargar. Anyway, he's an awesome man, but his father was quite an awesome man. He was 90 years old, and he just passed away this past week. His name was James Bargar. 90 years old, he died at the Kobacher House. What is exceptional about this gentleman is for 38 years, he uh, designed and planned parks in the state of Ohio for the city of Columbus, for Delaware, uh, for another co uh, county, I forget what it was, but he all, one of them was Ennis Woods. Isn't that amazing? Sharon Woods. He's done the high banks, and they're all exceptional, but anyway, the soul this gentle, wonderful soul just passed, and um, he was buried this morning, so it's a little too late. I didn't get on the computer until I kind of shy away from it now. So that is the sad one this morning. But then, this what I'm really up here about that is so good is we have a new project coming out that you should be seeing up here and in your bulletin. Did you know that 40 to 50% of our good youth groups and families will drift from God and church after high school? We see it. It happens, and it's happened to us. 
Did you know that those who remain connected to the church and flourish in their faith have multiple adult believers who have intentionally chosen these children to pray for, to befriend, and be with them? You can see the ones because they're the ones that are still here. Uh, in fact, research shows that the adult believers are crucial in passing on the lasting faith to the next generation. In light of these studies, the Pray For Me campaign was launched. I'm so excited about this. I'm extremely excited about this. I can see the ability of taking a child that's just starting to school, I don't care what grade, but for the time that they're there, praying for them daily and letting them know that you care about them and praying that they stay fast with Jesus and sharing your relationship with Jesus, man, that's hot. That is so good for these kids. They're going to want to be excited and stay in it. So will you be a part of this? We have, we need prayer warriors. We need people that are concerned that our children have disappeared. And it's not just our church, but they are disappearing and going to where their connection with their family and God aren't there. So we have boards out in, in the lobby that we want you to sign up. Besides this, there is a booklet that comes along with it. So I think it's about going to be about $11.00 that shows you a day-to-day, week-to-week suggestion, wonderful suggestions that you can use to stay with that child. Some of us may, if we don't have enough people, some of us may have to take two or three, but how exciting for us to do this and then come and see these little ones and these teens and as they grow, still being here or not, and if they're not, then we connect with them outside of church. So anyway, we're asking and waiting for people that would like to really be a part of this. If you do, please join us and sign up out, out in the lobby. Thank you. Took too long. <laughs> you can have it. You got it. All right, thanks, Sandy. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I find the best way to stay connected is through our e-newsletter. Um, we've got a lot of things going on. If you look in the bulletin, there's many handouts. The best way to stay connected is through our e-newsletter. Uh, if you're not signed up for that, um, please let us know. Um, give us your email address and we'll get you signed up. A couple other announcements that I wanna call out. Um, one of them is Save the Date, coming up on August 19th for chapter two for our youth of the church. Uh, Jeremy and Brooke are doing a fantastic job getting uh, the, the next chapter uh, of our youth and um, taking care of them. So please stay tuned for that. Um, last but certainly not least is tonight. I think it's tonight. The glasses are working. Yeah, uh, yeah. August 5th tonight is a farewell party for Marquita and, Marquita and Gary, uh, David and Marcus Gilson. Uh, they are longtime church members, and they are headed to Florida. So please come out, um, say hello. It's not a goodbye. It's just a we'll see you later. How's that? All right, sounds good. Uh, Mr. Bob Bradley is coming up for our opening song, so please open your books, and I'll turn it over to you, sir. It's hymn 608, but before we sing, I'd like for everybody to stand up, stretch, hug, kiss, whatever, greet everybody on this beautiful Sabbath morning. Everyone, before we sing, greet the people that are new here and say hello. Oh, honey. Become a little fish. Well, I'm old too. Oh. 
All right, as you get back to your seats, let's all stand together. Hymn 608, Faith is a Victory. Everyone, let's sing together. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowy skies against the foe in us below. Again, their strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Sing it out now. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Men with me on this stanza, men only. On every hand the foe we fall. Come on, men, let me hear you. Salvation's hell led on each head with truth again about. The earth shall tremble, the our tread and echo with her shout. Everyone. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Sing it now, ladies, show them. Ladies on this stanza. To him. Sing it out, ladies. Everyone singing now. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Repeat the chorus now. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Thank you. Be seated, please. Morning, church. Uh, to those who can, uh, would you please bow or kneel down for a prayer. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to let us come and worship you. Thank you, God, for this day that you blessed for us to be closer to you. Be with your humble servant, Chaplain Thompson, as he is about to speak to us. Open our hearts, Lord, so that we can hear your message. And dear God, we thank you for different ministries that are in this church. Help us hear our calling so that we can serve you. Bless those who are not here with us. We ask you to be with them. We know there are some in health problems. 
Be with them, dear God. You are the healer. You are the consoler. Be with them. Be with us also here as you're about to pour your blessings. We pray this and many more in Jesus Christ. Amen. May the deacons come out front for offering, please. <clears throat> I just want to thank each and every one of you for your faithful giving to this uh, church. Your giving each and every month, every week, it's doing something. Um, we had a successful VBS. Um, so in your giving, would you also consider giving towards that ministry? Um, we have different ways that we can give. You can write a check. You can um, set, up, set up an SCH. You can use online giving. And we also have this new cool way of giving uh, using your mobile device. Um, you can download this uh, app on your device and then scan on the back of the bulletins there's a QR code you scan there it gives you step by step on how to give please consider that and we bow uh, our heads for a prayer God we thank you as we are about to uh, give you this tithe and offering. Thank you for your blessings and bless the tithe and offering that we are about to receive on your behalf. Bless each and everyone that is giving. Open the floodgates of blessings on them. Also bless those who are not able to give today. Please bless them with their needs too. Help us uh, utilize these many ways of giving so that we don't miss up on your blessings. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
morning again, um, just before I sing. And I know you guys get tired of hearing me up here all the time, but uh, she had no one else to do a solo, so she said, with your limp knee, would you do a solo this morning? <laughs> but I went to see my surgeon yesterday. He checked me out. I thank you for all my prayers. He said, you're done with me. And he says, you can go back to work. I said, I've been working the last month. He almost passed out. <laughs> I said, you know, and this, you can't sit at home like some of the rich folks. I have to get out there and get it. So he said, well, you're in good shape for an old man. I guess the Lord has really blessed me. And speaking of old men, I want uh, a young fellow that I've known for years. Joe, would you stand? This is Joe Ryan Jr. I used to sing with his dad in a quartet in D.C. years ago. Now he's getting old, so you know I'm real old. He was this size when I knew. We used to call him Junior. <laughs> and <laughs> his dad was a uh, family practice doctor, but he had a music mind that was something. And we used to have a quartet called the Chamberman, and we sang all over the East Coast. And Joe, Von Rimmers, when I see you, because it's been a long time. Thank you for standing for us. I sang this song once before, but I thought we would do something to get uh, Chaplain Kelvin going. Incidentally, I was here for the first service, and he really, he's got a great sermon, and he has a great song to sing at the end of the service. So I, I'm not trying to outshine you because I know you're going to do well, okay? All right, I'm ready. Yes, I want to tell you now Uh-huh, uh-huh I took the challenge When I thought that I could stand I knew it wouldn't be an easy thing Cause it messed with Satan's plans God gives me daily strength To live in victory Though the powers of hell may come my way Greater is he in me, I'm singing Greater, greater, greater is he in me I'm singing, I'm shouting, I'm happy as can be I'm a soldier in an army that never has known defeat Greater, greater, greater is God in me Oh yes, for long I wandered in this cold, cold world alone. Heartbreaking unhappiness is all I had ever known. Then I met God's only son and listened to my plea. And now my life is a brand new chapter. Greater is he in me, I'm singing. Greater, greater, greater is he in me. I'm singing, I'm shouting, I'm happy and I'm free. I'm a soldier in an army that never has known defeat. Greater, greater, greater is he in me. Greater, greater. Greater is he in me I'm singing, I'm shouting I'm happy and I'm free I'm a soldier in an army That never has known defeat Greater, greater Greater is God in me I'm a soldier in an army That never has known defeat Greater, 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 greater is God in me. Well, 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 greater is God in me. Hallelujah.
the mic working? There we go. Thank you, Bob. That was really good. I feel like dancing now, but I won't. All right, let's pray before I begin. Father, we thank you for this moment. We pray that your spirit would speak to us today and that they would hear you, uh, not me. So we thank you for all that you've done and will do. In Jesus' name, amen. My sermon today is entitled, Doubt. In the movie titled the same, Doubt, starring Meryl Streep and Philip Seymour Hoffman, Seymour plays a priest in this movie, and in his first sermon, he has these words. He says in the movie, what do you do when you're not sure? He says, last year when President Kennedy was assassinated, who among us did not experience the most profound disorientation, despair? Which way? What now? What do I say to my kids? What do I say to myself, he says. It was a time of people sitting together, bound together by feelings of hopelessness. The sermon then ends with these words, there are those of you in church today who knows exactly of the crises of faith of which I describe. And I want to say to you, doubt can be a bond as powerful and sustaining as certainty. When you are lost, he says, you are not alone. Webster's Dictionary defines doubt several ways, including fear, suspect, to call into question the truth of, to lack confidence in, and to consider unlikely. To be sure, doubt is a very normal part of every human experience. Back in 2014, the leader of some 80 million Anglican worshipers, the so-called uh, Most Reverend Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he shared that at times he questioned if God was really there. His exact response to being asked if he had doubts about God was, quote, it is a really good question, he said. The other day I was praying over something as I was running, and I ended up saying to God, look, this is all very well, but isn't it about time you did something if you're there? And then he, can, he ended by saying, which is probably not what the Archbishop of Canterbury should say. But I bet, like the Archbishop, some of you might have said the very self-same thing. God, isn't it about time you did something about A, B, or C? Isn't it time, Lord? I have a question for all of us this morning, and it's one that I'm going to raise my hand to off the bat, and I do want you to raise your hands too if it applies or if you think it's true for you. How many of you would say that at some point in your Christian walk, you have doubted either part or maybe even all of your religious experience? Okay, so that's most people. So again, I think it's clear to say that doubt is a common part of our human existence. As Seventh-day Adventists, we proclaim directly in the name by which we are identified that we are 100% concerned about the second coming. Isn't that so? We are, after all, Seventh-day Adventists, right? So even in our very name, we tell the world right off the bat, hey, this is what we are about. We are about the second coming. If I were to ask the question, how many of you believe in the second coming, I'm fairly certain that every single one of you would say, I, I believe, right? I do a fair amount of reading. Uh, I like to read just, you know, stuff, articles. I have this app on my phone. It's called, um, I think it's called Popular or something like that, Daily something. Anyhow, it has various articles about various topics, and I like to just scroll through those and read them on a daily basis when I have time. Uh, as I was reading this week, a couple stories jumped out at me. The first one is a CBS News story, and it read, the U.S. Air Force successfully launched an unarmed intercontinental ballistic missile from California, the fourth such test this year. In a statement, the Air Force said, while not a response to recent North Korean actions, 
The test demonstrates that the United States nuclear enterprise is safe, secure, effective, and ready and able to deter, detect, and defend against attacks on the United States and its allies. In another article, Hannah Dreyer writes for the Associated Press concerning Venezuela, I came to Caracas as a correspondent for the Associated Press in 2014, she says, just in time to witness the country's accelerating descent into a humanitarian crisis, catastrophe. Talking about the food shortages in Venezuela, she says, the first time I saw people line up outside the bakery near my apartment, I stopped to take photos. How amazing, a literal bread line. Then she writes, true hunger crept into where I lived. People started digging through the trash at all hours, pulling out vegetable peelings, soggy pizza crusts, and eating them on the spot. That seemed like rock bottom, she says, until my local bakery started organizing lines each morning. Not to buy bread, mind you, but to eat trash. People waited for, the for their turn to hunt through black bags of bakery garbage. A young woman found a box of muffin crumbs. A teenage boy found a juice container and drank whatever remained. And then this last article reads, the headline reads, Yemen, million children at risk for cholera, charity says. The charity director said, after two years of, an of armed conflict, children are trapped in a brutal cycle of starvation and sickness. And it's simply unacceptable, she writes. Our teams are dealing with a horrific scenario of babies and young children who are not only malnourished, but also infected with cholera. I didn't have to go very far to find those articles, and there are much more like them. Just this week, these three articles were written. I read them, and here I am telling you about them now. So I wonder, what does the Bible have to say about anything like these going on? Does it line up? Does it not? Well, let's turn to Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 13. Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 13. And I'll begin to read. After they reached the top of the Mount of Olives, just outside the city, some of the disciples asked him, meaning Jesus, when will these things happen? Will all this happen after you go away and then come back to set up your kingdom at the end of the world? Verse 4, Jesus looked at them and said, the most important thing for you to know is to be careful not to be deceived. Verse 5, many will come and preach in my name, claiming to be sent by me, and others will even claim to be the Messiah. They will deceive many. Verse 6, before the end comes, there will be more and more threats of wars. But don't be discouraged, Jesus said, or give up your faith, because God must let some of these things happen. Verse 7, these wars will increase in scope as time goes on, and many nations will participate in them. Also, there will be great famines in different places, different parts of the world, widespread epidemics, and severe earthquakes. Matthew 24, 8, these natural disasters will show that a new kingdom is soon to be born, just as the labor pains of a mother let her know that her baby is on its way. Those who are loyal to me will be persecuted and even killed. They will be hated by all nations because they love me. Verse 10, even believers, believe it or not, will turn from the faith and will so hate one another that they will turn each other over to the authorities. Verse 11, false preaching will be going on everywhere and many people will be deceived. Moral decay will be so prevalent that most people won't even know what love is any longer. But verse 24, 13 says, but those who stand firm until the end will be saved. So, does that not sound just like what I read to you before from the news this week? Everything that was mentioned in Matthew 24, 3, 13 is happening right now. Severe epidemics, famine, wars and rumors of wars. 
It's happening right now, today, in 2017. So it seems like the second coming is near, at least nearer, would you say? And yet, there are texts like 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, First of all, know without any doubt that mockers will come in the last days with their mocking, following after their own human desires and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? What has become of it? For ever since the fathers fell asleep in death, all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation. Given that these are the last days, I wonder today, who are those mockers in your life? Who are they? Back then, the mockers were the teachers of the philosophy called Epicureanism. This philosophy was developed and taught by one Epicurus. Uh, he basically taught that undisturbedness was the highest good and that only the gods could possess this undisturbed feeling or state. But he went on to say to those Christians back then, why do you continue to frustrate yourself, to cause yourself to be agitated, to be in fear, by believing in this ridiculous thing called the return of Jesus, the coming of Jesus? He says, things have gone on the way it's gone on for such a long time. Nothing has happened. Uh, why do you continue to cause yourself suffering by believing in this nonsense, essentially, he would have said. ...to be disturbed when you don't have to be that way. And so these teachers mocked the Christians of that age. Again, I ask you, who are your mockers today? Your neighbor, perhaps? Your friend? Your boss? Even more critically, is your mocker your spouse? Is it your children, your family, your parents? Or maybe is your mocker yourself? It's easy for discouragement to set in, given today's reality, given the many world events that are going on right now, given the way the world is in such tension, uproar, given all the terrible and wicked things that are taking place, it's easy for us to begin to think, perhaps, that God, perhaps maybe he isn't going to intervene. Perhaps maybe this thing about uh, punishment, judgment, perhaps it's all a fairy tale. Perhaps there really is no such thing. It might be easy to go down that road, to think that the world will, in fact, just continue on and on as, as it's been. I mean, after all, you get up every day, you go to work or school, send your kids off to work or school, you do this day in and day out. Many of you have been around for a while. Me, about 40 years. And we've done the same things day in and day out, right? Our parents, some of us have died. Our grandparents have died. They believe the same thing, perhaps, about Christ's return. And the world seems to continue to just go on, doesn't it? On and on and on and on. And yet we continue to say there is a second coming. Christ is coming back to take us home. Even though, according to people like the Epicureans, it seems to be a waste of time. So, I know by now you think I'm going to give you some really great and profound solution, right? You probably think that. But in fact, I really don't have any profound solution for you today. I really don't have any great grand words and uh, theories to say to you today. What I do have to submit to you, to you, however, is a great example that I think is the key for maintaining who we are and for keeping you intact as a Christian believer. Here's what I have to offer you. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse, beginning in verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11 Beginning in verse 8, it says, When Abraham was called to leave the comforts of his home in Ur, to live in tents in a land he was supposed to inherit, he obeyed. Even though he did not know exactly the place where he was going, by faith, it says, 
He lived there as a foreigner together with Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of the same promise. Hebrews 11.10 says, By faith he looked forward with confidence to a city with lasting foundations, whose designer and builder is God. It was faith in God's promise that enabled Abraham and Sarah to become parents. Even though she was too old to have children, God worked a miracle and she conceived and gave birth to a son. So from old man and his, from one old man and his aged wife, whose body was practically dead, came so many descendants that today they are as numerous as the stars in the sky and as difficult to count as grains of sand beside the sea. Hebrews 11.6 says, But it is impossible to please God without having what? Faith. Those who come to God must not only believe that he exists, but that he cares and rewards those who search for him. That's the answer, my friends. The only solution I have for you today is a continued commitment to your faith. F-A-I-T-H. It sounds simple, but we just saw here that faith was the only thing that caused Mr. Abraham to leave his place of comfort, his place of satisfaction, and venture out into a place where he knew not. And I wonder how many of us today, if God came to you today and said, hey, I want you to leave your comfortable house, your comfortable job, your comfortable whatever it may be, and do X, Y, Z that makes you uncomfortable, how many of us would say that we have that kind of faith today? How many of us would pick up our belongings and move on to a place where we didn't even know where we were headed to? Does this kind of faith exist in today's world? Is it even possible to have this kind of faith? Well, if Abraham was a man, and he was, and he did have this kind of faith, I would say it is possible for you and me to also have this kind of faith. But do we? Is the question. On August, 18, on August 8th, 1914, Sir Ernest Shackleton set out with 28 men with the intent to cross the Antarctic continent from one coast to the next via the South Pole. They began their journey on the sub-Antarctic island of South Georgia. Their ship was called the Endurance. As they began their journey, the, the ship battled her way through a thousand miles of packed, dense ice over a six-week period and was 100 miles away from their destination. However, on January 18, 1915, the ice began to close in around the Endurance. They were immensely disappointed that their journey was stymied, it was stuck, it was stopped by this ice. But the men remained hopeful because of their leader, Mr. Shackleton, who they called affectionately the boss. The team continued to do all they could to save their beloved ship, but on November 21st, 1915, the, the, the ship finally broke up and sank below the ice. By December 20th, Mr. Shackleton had decided that it was time to leave the camp they had built and head on by foot carrying supplies and three lifeboats. On April 12, 1916, they ended up on an island called Elephant Island. Eventually, Shackleton realized that in order to secure rescue for him and his team, they would have to leave. He would have to venture out to get back to the same island where they began their journey, South Georgia. And so the only problem from getting from Elephant Island to there were 800 miles of the roughest stretch of ocean, perhaps, in the world. But on April 24th, 12 days after arriving on Elephant Island, Shackleton and five other crew members set out for South Georgia Island. As you can imagine, the journey was difficult. They experienced frostbite. They experienced water constantly getting into the ship that it'd have to bail out. It was not easy. On May 7, 1916, Shackleton and the men reached the South Georgia Island, but unfortunately, they landed on the wrong side. So three of them were too weak to go on. They stayed there, but Shackleton and two of the other men began to cross the mountains to get to the other side of that island, where there would be a whaling station, there'd be help. So at three o'clock in the afternoon of May 20th, 1916, Shackleton and those two men arrived 
at the destination in South Georgia. After the rescue, the three members left on the other side of the island. They gathered their strength for a few days, and then on the 23rd of May, Shackleton and two crew members set out for Elephant Island to rescue the 22 members left behind. On their first attempt, they were 60 miles out when, suddenly, the ice became too thick and they had to turn back to the Falkland Islands. Upon request, the government of Uruguay loaned them another ship. Again, they tried to seek rescuing the men, but again, the ice was too thick and they had to turn around. So Shackleton and his team of two went to Punta Arenas in southern Chile, where they met British and Chilean residents who gave them 1,500 pounds. And they were able to charter a schooner named the Emma. This time, 100 miles north of Elephant Island, the engine broke down, and again, they had to be t turned away. So now a fourth attempt would be necessary. For this fourth attempt, the Chilean government lends the steam tug Yelko to Shackleton and his team. And so it was on August 30th, 1916, after 137 days of being stuck on Elephant Island, Shackleton and his crew reached the island and was able to get the men that they left behind. The men were packed, ready to go, and because of this, they were able to turn around in just one hour. After the men were asked, how is it? You know, it was 137 days out. And they responded saying, actually, we packed up and readied ourselves every single day. And the reason why we did that, they said, is because the boss said he was coming back and we believed him. And so because we believed him, we were ready every day to go because we knew he was coming back even though we didn't know what day it would be. Likewise, my friends, your master, Jesus has said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and do what? Receive you unto myself and I will take you that you may be where I am. If these men could have such belief in a man, how about your belief in your Savior? Do you hold on to your Savior as much as, and I hope even more, than these men held on to their, to their Savior, their boss? Jesus has told you and I that he will come back again and take us home someday. Do you believe it? Are you, however, living like you believe it? Because there is a difference, right? A belief should make a difference in our lives, especially one such as this, by faith, my friends, it's the only way you and I will make it to the end. I want to point out that Matthew did say something that's kind of scary. It said that even believers will turn against each other. We don't know who's, who those folks will be. I pray that it is neither you or me, but the Bible does say that will happen. And so we know that the reality of losing our faith is a very real one. And so the admonition today to continue in your faith, to hold on to your faith, is a serious one. Because it is so easy, I believe, in this current time, with all these challenges, being battered left and right, so many different problems coming our way, to perhaps lose our faith. But this is not the time to turn back, friends. This is the time to hold on even stronger to what you have believed in, to what has led you to where you are today. The faith of Jesus, my friends, that you have in him, the faith in the blessings that he gives to you, do you take time to acknowledge those blessings that are all around you? Even in your difficult circumstances, we are most blessed. Amen? By faith, you are able to stand up for the right, even when the wrong is right in front of you. We talked about today in the Sabbath school with the youth, the influence of friends and how the friends we choose are, crit the friends we choose are critical. Perhaps maybe some of your friends might not believe the way you do and maybe will turn on you at some point. Faith is the only thing that will allow you to not give in to peer pressure because adults do give in to peer pressure too, not just teenagers. By faith, you can become and ma maintain all that Jesus wants you to become. So my brothers, my sisters, this admonition this morning is one that says don't give up. No matter what, no matter who doesn't believe in what you know to be true, and it may very well be your spouse sitting right next to you, it could be anybody, 
But Jesus has given us a promise, and we ought to hold on to that promise. We ought to believe in it, not necessarily because we have seen it, but because he said it. If Jesus says it, you can believe it. Amen? I'm going to sing this song for you to end. said they must cross the water. Now he was sleeping in the stern. Quick as the flash of summer lightning. Caught on a sea of crashing Waking him up and crying, save us. But they didn't need to be afraid. Never lost. He knows where you're going. Never lost. Even though the wind. And there may be some stormy seas that he says you must cross. But with Jesus at your side, you're never lost. We used to rise and face the morning. Like it was just another day But now we know Without a warning How quickly everything Can change It's like we're standing In a doorway And what lies beyond we cannot see But as we step into the next moment Or into eternity Never lost Where you're headed 
never lost Even though the wind is blowing And there may be some stormy seas That he says you must cross But with Jesus at your side You're never lost Oh no Because he knows where you're going Never lost, never. even though the wind is blowing, and there may be some stormy seas that he says you must cross. But with Jesus at your side, you're never lost. Never lost. You're never lost. You're never lost. You're never lost. Oh no, oh no. You're never, never lost. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that we can believe in 100% everything that you have said. Now, there is always going to be room for us to doubt. Doubt will no doubt creep in. But, Father, we know that if we just hold on, in spite of, that in spite of faith that the three Hebrew boys had when they were thrown into the fire, if we just have that faith that says no matter what, even if it appears that my faith is nonsense, I'm going to hold on no matter what. If we keep that uppermost in our mind, and if that's how we function, Lord, then I'm pretty sure that we'll all make it. So, Father, help us to stay strong, to stay committed, to live for you every day. In Jesus' name, amen.